Hi, so I'm Jason Gillum. Uh, my talk is about the Monica Bellucci fan club, which is actually the title, like this, you'll see, it's weird. But it's for learning from like the trick bot to forum dump. So, uh, I find cool detection rules at Red Canary. Uh, we're a company that does like, we're an MDR basically and some XDR things, but uh, we, we find detection rules. And so I've seen ransomware happen a couple times. We have different customers. Some come on in the middle of an engagement. So sometimes you see different parts of the life cycle of ransomware and the circle of life. Uh, sometimes it's at the beginning, sometimes the middle, sometimes it's at the end, and you see just ransomware being deployed. Uh, I'm an, also an Air Force cyber operator, which sounds really cool, but it's pretty, I think it's kind of it's kind of it's what is what it is. <laughs> uh, a one before for those people who know field numbers or whatever. Uh, I went to Italy for an Air Force thing to do a, a CPT assessment of a network. I came back with only four bottles of wine. I should have came back with 24, like some other people in my group did, with suitcases full of wine. Uh, and then I like I I like to call, think of myself as like a moth to a dumpster fire. So like I just like to like get drawn in by it and like look at the nuts, the craziness that's happening in some of these places sometimes. So I like to play with the data in Splunk and kind of understand what's going on there. And that kind of gave me some insight into what we're going to talk about too. So, I also like to say I appreciate that these badges go up to 11, because, I mean, if they went up to 10, that wouldn't be as cool. So, you know. Uh, so, as an overview, the TrickBot forum, uh, I highly recommend you, I'm going to kind of walk through how I like parse this data, and so you can do it yourself, because it's available online, all publicly accessible. Um, yeah, so and I'd say I took away stuff that a detection engineer takes away, so like I'm looking for things to detect, whereas like a CISO might take away policy things, or red teamer might take away different cool te techniques or tactics or whatever. Um, yeah, and then Conti's disbanded, but like really, they didn't disappear. They're, they just spread into other groups, so you'll see these kind of techniques used again in other groups. And this stuff isn't specific to the ransomware per se, it's the stuff that leads up to it. So as the situation, the situation unfolded in Ukraine in February, uh, this security researcher, I actually had this as, I didn't know who it was, and then I like saw his, on his own Twitter, he posts like the CNN interview with himself. Um, and he said basically, like he's an, he was a cybersecurity researcher, an IT guy, and he just was somehow in this forum and just was like, screw these guys, or avoid the profanity, uh, and uh, dumped everything online. And I guess the FBI reached out to him and said, hey, could you stop, not do that, or whatever? But he had dumped already a whole lot of data online. So um, we're going to talk about what we could find through that. Um, one of the things I noticed with a lot of when this was dumped was people talked about the chat logs, like Krebs on security had a whole bunch of stuff about like interpersonal relationships, business operations of the whole thing and stuff like that, but nobody really talked about that thing you can, you can kind of see in, in the red circle, which is the forum link leak. And it was basically like a playbook. And if somebody, if people are like cyber operators in the Air Force, we have like a school we go to and it was kind of like that where it was just like, Here's how you do this thing. Here's how you do this thing. So this is kind of a collection of those things that I learned from it and were like detection things that you can look for when you're, if you see this in your network, it's probably a bit, a pretty bad sign. So one of the problems with this was it was all Russian and I don't read Russian. I'm not a, I'm not a Russian linguist. So, uh, and it was also split across like, like 50 or 60 text files. So I just like, you, oh yeah, and it, so this guy, the Parmac, posted it on GitHub, and it's it's on there, publicly accessible. That's the link at the bottom. You can go to it. It's I wouldn't recommend downloading it because I downloaded on a government computer, and it like antivirus quarantined it. It was kind of mad about that. But um, uh, this guy, whoever ran this through a deep learning AI <coughs> translating stuff or Google Translate and some other stuff, that guy's the real MVP in this to me. But I just been going through it, and I kind of look found some cool stuff. So, because I'm, I'm a hacker man, I just took all the text files and just made one text file. So that's all you, all I had to do was just pipe it. I made a mistake when I was doing this. Like I, I was like, oh, I'll just send the text file to the same folder, and that, you know, 
it looked through all the text files, found, dumped them all in one file, and then found another text file, and dumped all that to the same file, and it like kind of ended up in a loop for a bit until I figured that out, but that's fine. <laughs> so, who's Monica Bellucci? She is an Italian actress, and her name is in the top, I don't know if people have ever been on a website with like the breadcrumbs thing, but like, the title of the f website is like the the first breadcrumb usually. So her, the name of the website was for some reason the Monica Bellucci fan club. So I thought that was pretty funny and I had to delete her name like a hundred times as I was going through this. I dumped it into like Google Docs so you'll see some screenshots of um, the formatted text from, from me working in Google Docs. And I had to delete her name, and name a bunch of times and it drove me nuts. <laughs> so, so in general what tools they use is like a mixture of tools, uh, people who are in the red team or the blue team side of things, a lot of it is lull bins, which is like any tool that's on Windows that's already there by default. Uh, NL test, net, PowerShell, most of the stuff you, you'd expect, basically. Um, and then they use a lot of traditional red team tools. Uh, the ones that were in the document were Cobalt Strike, Rubius, Seatbelt, and Sharp Chrome. And I've seen most of these used in some form or in a, like a red, on red teams, pen testers, and, and these guys. Um, and then I also see some stuff, I don't think I've seen a lot of red teams use. Uh, we see some red teams here and there at work because they're trying to test our detection rules. Uh, but the, I saw our clone, documentation for our clone, ngrok, and AD find, and Tor. I think I left that one out there. But, uh, and then some remote access tools, which are like, the examples I have here are AnyDesk, Atera, and like Splashtop, but it seems like sometimes when they burn one tool, they'll just rotate to another. So you can kind of just find, if you can find them all and list them all, that would be great. But uh, <laughs> those are the, one, the first ones that I could think of, and AnyDesk is, is mentioned very specifically in the documentation. So for low bins, there wasn't much for that, for that stuff, like I don't think I even saw like Cert Util or any of those fancy little bins in here. It was just mostly net, NL test, and and then I'll get to the PowerShell stuff. But like for the net stuff, they're just usually looking for a domain admin, and they're trying to find. I think one thing they want is like net account, which like gets you the password policy because they want to know how fast they can how how to not lock you out. So like the the password tries and the password policy and that kind of stuff. Um, NL test is they use DC list specifically, which gives them again a, a path to the domain controller they can find. Um, and some other stuff that you'll see sometimes is like domain trust, all trust. All this NL test stuff is not something people look for uh, generally. I think if there's not a lot of detection rules, but like you can just look for all three of all, all those in one big list, and it'll probably catch some. It's not common for admins to use this stuff. So, so, one of the first tools they mentioned, and this is one I'm not familiar with, so I don't have a lot of information about it, and it didn't have a lot of context on how they use it. It just had like the script for subdrill, which uh, again, there's the link for it down at the bottom there. Uh, it's kind of like a basically you give it a domain, and it like spits out all the subdomains. So if they want to find the exchange server from the outside or the Domain controller, the EDFS stuff, uh, internal servers, their, what your jump boxes maybe are if they're listed on the internet somehow. So it'll go through a whole bunch of resource, OSINT resources to find those subdomains and other stuff. So it makes sense that they would use it, uh, but it wasn't clear exactly how they used it. Uh, and so to the surprise of nobody, they use Cobalt Strike. Uh, if anybody's in security at all, they're probably not surprised that they use it. But um, a lot of the stuff they have was like how to set up a Cobalt Strike server, how to make it stealthy, how to what what operating system requirements are like there. They say they use an Ubuntu server with um, 16 gigs of data, 500 SATA, uh, all that stuff. So. This is pretty much what they use, kind of their server, and it has a whole giant list of like config scripts for that stuff. Yeah, and so some of the things they use to make it more stealthy are something called C2 Concealer from 40 North. Again, I think you'll find like a lot of this stuff is like freely available online. Anybody can play with it, so it's kind of cool for everybody out here. You can play with these tools and make your own Conti or, or simulate it. Uh, and personal experience from seeing Cobalt Strike 
uh, they don't put this much effort into to make it stealthy, so like some of the defaults for Cobalt Strike, we'll see in a second. They randomize some of it, but generally, uh, you'll see this is Cobalt Strike bot at the top there. That's a Twitter account that just posts Cobalt Strike information, like their spawn two values, which those are command lines. So like, I don't think you really see run DLL32 making a network connection without a command line. It's pretty, that's pretty weird. So it's a pretty easy alert when things are going bad. All, all of these, if you see them without a command line and making network connections, it's probably not a good sign. Um, our Red Canary has a, has a whole blog about Cobalt Strike and, how to, and like stuff to look for with it. There's tons of research on the, out, out there online. This is another good one I saw was from uh, Michael Kaz Kazara. Uh, but like it's just stuff out there everywhere. Just kind of finding the defaults because um, you can change the defaults, but these guys do not change the defaults. Sometimes like the what's it the the watermark is like just some is the same one every time. So you'll start to see a lot of the defaults used. And if you can detect all of the defaults and they change some of them, you'll still catch them. So one of the first things they use, and again this is kind of like. People think of Tor as like a browser to get to the internet anonymously, but like they use it kind of the other way around. They'll download, they'll use it to basically anonymize their traffic coming in. So they'll run the Tor client on your bot on the box they're on, they're hopping from into your network, and they'll basically redirect SSH and RDP to the Tor client. And so, yeah. So here's an example. This is from our own security platform um, for a customer of some kind. Uh, in this case, it says Google updates .exe. It is not Google updates, it's Tor. And you can see the command line has NT service, which allows it to run as a system service, and F with a file with a file after it for the Tor um, config, which basically tells Tor like how to what 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 nodes what kind of nodes to use and also all this other stuff and like to they can probably configure that to to their heart's content or just use a default one again. So some detection logic for Tor, you can, this is, it's kind of a weird one to do because I had to, I, when I was making this detector a while ago, um, you can look, you have to look for a file, one of these files related to Tor called a state lock or cache micro whatever that file and in an app data roaming Tor folder. And if they're running it as an NT service, it's going to not be under a user like you would think that if people are familiar with Windows, the app data roaming folder is usually under the user folder. There's also one under Windows service profiles, so it could be there as well. So if you just see those those files ex popping up, that's not a good sign. If you just see the Tor folder popping up, that's probably not good either. Um, and for us, we don't, we say ignore Tor.exe because we're expecting it to be renamed. So this is kind of the summary of how like that backdoor Tor script gets set up. First, they download Tor or NGROC, which is another one we'll get to. Uh, they'll download NSSM, which is the Not Sucking Service Manager, and rename Tor to sysmon.exe. They'll, oh yeah, they run it, they put it in windows.temp. And again, like, some of this is like, I wouldn't look for windows.temp to sysmon necessarily, that's just one place they put it. So don't get hung up on looking for it exactly there. It could be anywhere, but as long as you're finding Tor, wherever it's at. Um, yeah, they, then they use NSSM, which is basically a tool to create services. It's a, it's like a tool that basically is a command line tool to make services on a computer. So uh, then they install SSH and uh, Tor, yeah, and start all services. And then they create a firewall to rules to allow SSH inbound. So that's kind of how it works, and that's like the the net sucking service managers web page. Again, like it's. I think it's nssm.cc, but so if you ever want to play with it, like as an admin, you could even use it because you want to make services or you just want to test some things. So ngrok is another tool I don't think I, I hear much about, but it's a, it's kind of like Tor, except at the ngrok instance runs on the box and it connects to tunnel .ngrok.com or ngrok.io, and you'll see some of like the common um, also, rats use it. Like they'll they'll run their server on the other end on a on ngrok and use it to beacon out. But in this case, they're using it the other way. They're using it as an ingress point to to get into your network uh, with ngrok. 
So here's, this is literally from the Engrok website. Like anybody can go here, it's a free service. So like this is like how to set it up. You give it, you download, you unzip it, you, you give it an auth token, which is basically your key to, to use Engrok. Uh, and then it has a help, a nice help dashboard, help page and all sorts of nice documentation. So it's very, very easy for this, <laughs> for, to use this stuff. And then here's an example. The script is kind of hard to read, so I'm just gonna, like I talked through it a moment ago, it just basically downloads it, runs it, from, puts it in the, renames it, puts it in Windows 10 or what, somewhere, like we saw Google Updates or whatever that was. Uh, and in this case, ngrok here is running with running from the same folder, temp.sysmon. Uh, I've seen it run in some other places, and you see it make a connection out to tunnel.ngrok.com. So, yeah. Yeah, so the remote access tools, like I said, um, their documentation specifically calls out how to download any desk and run it from like usually the program data folder or something weird. Um, you can basically just look for activity related to any of these tools. If you see any desk in your environment with net support, you just kind of want to, you probably just figure out if you use it. Do you use VNC? Do you use, uh, T what was it, TeamsViewer or something like that? All this stuff, just net support especially, I think it's used legitimately by like schools, but for the most part, I don't see it used legitimately. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty weird. Atera, uh, and any desk, and yeah, I think our uh, I, I helped helped write a blog with Justin Schoenfeld at, at, at Red Canary about rats, and it's kind of cool. It's got a bunch of detection logic in it as well. So if you have a chance, check that out. It's got some other some additional things you can try. And then the next tool they use is called Sharp Chrome. Uh, it's kind of as it sounds, it does stuff with Chrome. It basically dumps passwords from Chrome. It takes the whole password database and just dumps it to the screen. They, they seem to use it with, when they take, when they dump the passwords, they dump them into a list, and then they dump, and they use it for a, um, another script called invoke smb auto boot, which we'll get to in a second, but it, they, they seem to like it to escalate things. Some other PowerShell stuff they use, there's PowerSploit, PowerSQL, and Empire. Um, PowerView is kind of a, a red team tool to basically get reconnaissance in the network. They use it mostly to find a network admin. They find, they like they just say, give me all the users with an admin an admin count of one or whatever, and then they'll look through those and try to find the guy that's like director of IT or is obviously going to have like domain admin privileges. So from there, and then they'll and then also they'll use Kerberos, which. If you guys aren't familiar with Kerberos, it basically you can run it on against um, the network, and you can kind of get hashes back and dump hashes to the screen, and then they can again use those to pivot through the network and stuff, or crack them offline and have the actual password. With a lot of hashes, you don't actually even have to crack the password; you just have to have the hash to authenticate. So, yeah, Conti likes to use some of these to basically just pivot into uh, users and. They'll just, sometimes, they'll, like I said, they'll take that hash and uh, crack it with a hash cat offline. Oh yeah, and then they use, far, sorry, uh, PowerUp SQL is basically a tool that lets you exploit SQL servers. They didn't really talk how they use it much, but like, it makes sense that they're gonna wanna steal all the data out of a SQL database, probably, so it, it pretty much makes sense. Uh, so like, for the PowerShell, this is kind of the example of the script. I'll just kind of like, Hit the points. They're looking through this domain, which is actually, a, I think, a domain. It's a real domain I looked up online. Sure, construction. <laughs> I'm not sure what happened there. I didn't see any like news announcements. But like a lot of these are really small companies. They're getting targeted, which is which really sucks for those people because they probably don't have a dedicated security team to properly secure things. Uh, they basically run and the auto root PowerShell script with a password list. Uh, like they took the list from Sharp Chrome. They'll say to use like. Spring 2020 or whatever year it is, because people use that password, uh, those kind of passwords. With, was it fall 2020, autumn 2021, with exclamation marks and some other stuff thrown in? So this is really easy stuff to like crack and hash cat because it's like people do this. Um, yeah, so they have some example passwords they use here: password one, welcome one, a, a keyboard walk for people that think they're being sneaky with their random password. That's a keyboard walk. It's not as <laughs> good as you think it is. 
Um, and in this case, they yeah, they take the list of passwords they found from the list, and then they they combine it with like a rock you or some kind of popular password list like that. And then they run it, and they see the result, which in this case, they got two admins uh, with the same password, and they scramble two domain admins. So curb roasting, uh, again, if people aren't familiar, it basically allows you to get a hash from the, a network interaction and get that, and then they can take that hash, they can dump all those hashes to a list, and then crack them in hashcat. Yeah, so you should just look for that on the host. If you see rubius.exe or Kerberos in a command line, that's probably not a good sign. Um, and again, Red Canary does have a blog about Kerberosing. They have a whole documentation on it with the guy who made Kerberos, which is kind of cool. Uh, yeah, and then here's from the script. Uh, they run it with the list of hashes, um, with looking for an admin count, and crack it. And then they have some commandment options in here, and they, they dump it to program data. Which again, like, for people that look at like stuff that happens on a box, there's not a lot of stuff that gets written to the root of program data. So that's probably another thing you could always look for, is just like, who's writing text files to program data? That's kind of weird, so. And then another tool they use, this is AD Find. I see this one also in a lot in QBot, which is another malware family that is like the, a bot that would lead into Conti or some other ransomware group. Uh, they'll, they'll usually, one of the first things they start running if, if somebody has hands on keyboard is, uh, is AD Find, which basically is a tool to enumerate the, the Active Directory network and find all the users they want to find. So. Uh, their, their, gu their guidance on how to use it and how to parse through it is pretty extensive. They're like, look for, look for users with an admin or IT, some keywords, and then pivot to that guy and pwn him or whatever. Yeah, and then from AD5, this is like some of the stuff they run in AD5. These are a whole bunch of command line options they run. Um, and they get like basically groups, at, uh, OUs, com a list of computers, users, subnets, Tr and trust dump, I'm not as familiar with that one, but it's an option in AD Find that gets like, I'm guessing, the Active Directory trust and stuff. And then, yeah, and then they say, let's look into AD Find at home, and um, they can find the users they want to find from there. So, Seatbelt is a tool uh, from Ghostpack, and it basically Let's them run, when they run, when you run an box, it gives them possible safety checks or opportunities for privilege escalation. And, all, and like when you do run it, it just gives you a whole bunch of reconnaissance bit specific to that host. So they'll probably run it on a box they're looking to escalate privileges on, or um, find some different pivoting opportunities because they want to get they probably want to run as like a NT service so that they can ex, they can dump out things that are really sensitive, which you need to have like super admin privileges for. So the next tool they use, again, this, this to me, like, when I, when I hear, like, people say this to the thing is NetGPP password, it basically looks for passwords stored in clear text on, in your Active Directory scripts, which sounds like that can't be, it can't be that easy, but I guess a lot of older IT uses, like, the password in the command line of when running certain things. So it's, it, I don't know how often it works, but I would hope not often, but if it does work, they have a password right there for probably what is a domain admin or an account that at least is valid in several places on the network. So they, can, they also use it, like in their documentation, they use netgpp.exe, so they're compiling some of these PowerShell scripts into binaries, so you won't necessarily see the PowerShell script running. You'll see like a weird exe with the command lines for netgpp. So like one of the detection rules we use sometimes is like if it's a random binary but it has like the command lines specific to like knit gpp that's probably a pretty big red flag that somebody's trying to do some stuff another tool they use is sharp view uh it's basically just power view but in c sharp so it's again it's compiled which i, I guess i'm sensing a the theme here and in general they kind of use it to find the domain user location so like again they find that admin they gotta figure out how to get to his box to get like more passwords and credentials off of him. So they'll, they'll, they'll use it to basically find, oh, I got an admin, um, I'm gonna find user's location and see all the computers he's logged into at the network. And then they'll look through that list and find the guy's laptop and then go on to there. 
So yeah, and then you can get that one, that one's on Tavora Threat on GitHub, and you can just download it and use it. So I would recommend if you have a lab at your work, or at least you have like some place to play with these tools, or like just if you're on the security team, just tell everybody you're running these tools and just play with them because they're they're not in themselves malicious. They're not gonna just pwn your network by themselves. They're how they're used that they pwn your network. So, and then this is a tool that's called Zero Login. They named it Zero.exe, and it's basically they said it's a tool of their own making, which I very much doubt, but whatever. It exploits. This is like the only CVE that I've, I saw in the whole documentation, and it basically allows them to get unauthenticated rem remote code execution on the domain controller, which again is like their keys, their their final goal is probably the domain controller because they want to get on there and dump some stuff and pwn that, pwn that stuff. So they'll pivot off through with that to get on the domain controller sometimes if that vulnerability isn't patched. Yeah, and then here's an example of how they use it. Here's like the command line options it takes. They take the, com the domain controller name and like possible commands to run or as, run it as a user um, and some other stuff. So I haven't run this tool myself. I don't know how to, I might have to look around to see how, if I can, but I don't have a, I don't have a lab network that has a domain controller right now, so I haven't played with it yet. These are some sneaky registry hacks. I actually just added these in last night because I was like, I was thinking about this as I was, finishing up these slides, I was like, oh man, these are like some cool things they do, and I'm, I'm kind of a Windows registry nerd, because I did a, I did a B-Sides talk a few years ago at B-Sides Springfield, and I talked about, what was it, uh, Eric Zimmerman's registry tools. Anyways, <laughs> um, some registry hacks that they add. Uh, this, there's entries in the registry. If you add something to the special accounts list, you can make that user account not appear at the login screen, which sounds pretty useful if you're adding a bunch of users to the network or adding an admin on all the boxes for them. Uh, they actually changed the default RDP port on that box, which again, is pretty, is, I thought was pretty sneaky. I didn't even think about, I mean, I didn't think you could, I mean, now that makes sense, but like, I didn't even think you could do that. That's freaking nuts. And so then there'll also be an accompanying um, firewall rule to allow that new port that they've added. And in their example, it was like 1350. Yep, and then here's an example of some of this stuff I just mentioned. They, they're they downloading AnyDesk here and installing it uh, to program data, and they're running it silently. Obviously, they're not gonna have it pop up on the screen. <laughs> um, and then they'll set a password for it, in that case, whatever that is with the J at the top, at the middle there. Uh, and then they'll, again, they make, it, they make a new user called old administrator. They're, they're trying to blend in with your network that's that they probably don't know who, what, so they just picked old administrator here. And then they add that user to the administrators and they add it to the user list special accounts. So this is like an ad, admin account they're adding to that local box and they're hiding it from, the, from, that, from that computer. Um, so, so like some places might be like, oh, there's a new user on my, de my login screen. That's weird, that, that would probably obviously trigger some kind of incident response. They're kind of smart about it. And then they add, they, in here they change the new RDP port. They allow, a NetS, uh, in this case we're using PowerShell, and they're just basically allowing the RDP port impound from, for uh, 1350. Um, and then again, they're changing the port for RDP, and they're restarting terminal services, which is what controls your RDP stuff. So this is some other stuff they do for privilege escalation. It, some, some stuff, like the, their proof, their, path to privilege escalation to me is like a lot simpler than I expected. They're gonna basically find that admin, uh, use sharp view, find the workstation, like I said, uh, use pass the hash, they specifically mentioned using that with Cobalt Strike and some other stuff once they get that hash. And then they'll look through that computer for all the sensitive stuff on that person's computer that they might be able to use to, to escalate the privileges again. Because they're, they need to basically get all the passwords. They need passwords to like, uh, like your Synology, your all your backup stuff. They need the passwords for not just that guy's that guy's credentials, but all the password credentials probably for the entire network. So you have to imagine there's a, a lot, a lot of a lot of possible credentials they need for a given network. So privilege escalation again. This is kind of the screenshots from my documentation. Um, I'll, I'll try to make these slides available on GitHub, on my, on my personal GitHub later after this too, by the way. I'll, 
I forgot how to share that. <laughs> uh, so again, the, one of the things I thought that was funny was they're like, now a noob or whatever would, would just drop a beacon on this guy's box, but that's not what we're doing. We're gonna be sneaky about it. They're like, we're gonna remote it to this guy's machine using a file share. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever worked in IR, but like, um, sometimes you get alert on a per given person's computer box and you just like type Windows run and that computer name C, C dollar. This is kind of that same thing. They're doing it in their way because in the context that they're working from, they're working probably from a Linux box that's authenticated to the network and pivoting through that, so they have to remote into that machine somehow. So they'll remote in using like FileZilla or some other tool, and they'll start looking through folders. They'll look through OneDrive, the downloads folder, the desktop, and they're like, does this guy look, does it look like this guy has a bunch of admin tools? Yep, he's an admin. So they'll look through App data, local roaming, this is kind of in, in Windows context, this is kind of like where configurations are stored, databases are stored, your password database for Chrome is stored here, um, key pass on the top right there, they look for that. And then they're also just like, it sometimes happens that there's just passwords.txt on the desktop, or passwords.docx in this example, or access.xls, and again, like, like the NetGPB, that sounds really stupid. Why would anybody do that? But it's literally in their documentation, so I'm pretty sure it works for them at least once or twice. So, and then they also say to download the Outlook file, which, in, again, if you ever logged into Outlook for the first time, it takes forever to load. It's because it's caching that entire, your entire inbox onto that computer. So the next time you open Outlook, it just pops right open. So, for them, they cache the entire, they take the whole, that whole cached file, Outlook file, that OST file, and then they take that off the network, and they'll, and they'll sift through it and try to find some more passwords. I think they're usually looking for the, um, what's it called? Your ransomware recovery policy with an with a insurer of some kind, so that they can know how much to charge you, because they know how much, your, what your limit is for that. Um, and then they also look for FileZilla. If for people that have used FileZilla before, it stores the credentials, I think, in clear text inside FileZilla on that computer. I mean, so it's a lot worse than like te the Teams vulnerability that people were going on about lately. So, and then and TDS dumping. I had a ga I had like a game over picture from this, but like it's not quite game over for and if they dump in TDS because it's like capture the flag or red versus blue where he's got the flag and he's like, now what, where do I go with this thing, or whatever. But one thing they usually do is they just run NTDS util and sometimes they'll be like, sometimes you get kicked off the network for doing this because obviously that's pretty, a pretty big red flag to be using that. Um, and so they do another thing that's sneakier, which I, again, I hadn't heard of this, but this is pretty smart. Uh, they enable volume shadow copies on that domain controller and then they, find the shadow copy path, which if you've used DSS admin, it's kind of weird, but like it gives you like a, a slash slash hard disk volume, something or other disk thing. So they can get into that and then find the NTDS file that's been snapshotted and steal it from there. So then you're not running NTDS dump, you're only running VSS admin. But running VSS admin on a domain controller, again, is pretty weird, so if you see uh, volume shadow copies being turned on on domain controller, that's also probably a pretty big red flag. If you see it really being just turned on in general, it's probably weird because, you know, it's probably something you do when the computer first set up, not like something you're gonna turn off and on all the time unless next time it, the, the credential rotation comes around. And if you don't, if so, it, it, they're still authenticated with the network. And then if they see that happening, they can probably uh, still use their credentials for a little bit longer enough to, to recover or whatever they need to do to, to basically get back in the network before you before their credentials expire. So if you do it twice, uh, it forces that authentication to happen right then and there instead of uh, later. I don't know, <laughs> it might be a day, sometimes it's, it just depends on the network. Uh, yeah, so they can come right back with that golden ticket, which is what they call that. So this is kind of a screenshot from the NTDS dumping that I was talking about with the VSS admin stuff. So they basically, they're, they're running it against the domain controller look from another box sometimes. So um, you'll see WMIC with like VSS admin and some commands to turn on the domain control, to turn on shadow copies, and then uh, they'll like seven zip it out of there, uh, off that box. So they'll just read it straight from the domain controller file share and dump it. So I, I haven't, 
I haven't seen it used like this, but I actually made this detector, a detector for this, and then we saw like a, a different ransomware group just enabling VSS Admin right on the box. They weren't even remoting into it, so that was a, that was kind of awesome to see it like immediately pay off for me. So another tool, again, this is like FileZilla, is like a file sharing tool. I, I mean, I wouldn't look for FileZilla on your network because it's very common for admins to use it or like just people doing their jobs with files on your network. But maybe if you see like Jan and HR using FileZilla, that's kind of weird. But they actually use it from the other side, from that, from that Linux machine that you have no control over. A lot of these ransomware incidents I, I've, I've noticed come from a VPN authenticated user, so you kind of have to find that user that's authenticated on the VPN, and they're remoting in through that to mount the file shares on that box they're trying to, to pwn. Next tool they use is called rclone. Again, this is a freely available tool um, with, it's similar to rsync, it basically allows you to sync your files across the network, which if, if you're thinking about it is not good. Not good if you, if you don't have control over who's syncing those files, that's not great. Um, with, uh, I forgot his name, uh, with the AI talk, uh, I think some of these network connections aren't to the same host. They're like thousands of connections sometimes. Because sometimes they're using like Megasync or some other cloud provider to sync these files out. So I don't know how that would look, but it would be a lot of files going out, but from one box. So you'd have a common source host, but not a common destination. So you could probably tune the rules somehow. Uh, again, uh, we did a good, really good blog on our clone. We called it our clone wars because it came on out on May the 4th. So I thought that was kind of awesome. Uh, there's a lot of, again with our clone, you just kind of look for the command lines that are big red flags that it's being used on the network. And you kind of, could you full find some users syncing files once in a while, but generally it's not used that much. So it's a pretty good tool and they have a lot of documentation in there, in Conti's documentation on how to use it. And the documentation for rclone is freely available online at rclone.org docs. So yeah, Justin and Aaron, uh, Justin again, Schoenfeld and Aaron Didier, they did a pretty good blog on rclone. So recommend it. Uh, the next, one of the other things they did that I thought was kind of notable, they have a, a bunch of different stuff that for different vendors like this, but they decrypt the passwords from Veeam, which for people that haven't used Veeam before, it allows you to back up your um, VMs, hence the name. Um, they use it to basically back to, to they run a, a, a command down at the bottom there that basically uses SQL, dumps the contents of the Veeam database, and from there, they actually have a, a, a .NET compiled file, script file that they compile and run it against this, and it gives them all the, all the Veeam passwords. Again, they're trying to get credentials to everything so that they can delete everything or steal everything or whatever they want to do. So then they stop all the things. So uh, they have a script, a ginormous script, that was just like three or four pages long of different command lines to run to stop various different things because they're about, to, they're, they're about to encrypt everything. So when they encrypt things, like a database, they have to have that database stopped. I don't know if people try to use files on Windows, but if you try to drag a file somewhere else and it's in use, it complains or whatever. So they avoid that by stopping everything and uh, encrypting it right after. So if you see this running, it's probably not good, and it's probably almost this close to game over if, if, if not it, if it isn't already starting to encrypt things. So in summary, like some things I, I recommend is read the manual. Uh, you can learn a lot from like some of these tools just by using them and find the documentation online for Sharp Chrome, for our clone, for all this stuff. You can just kind of use it. I mean, I wouldn't recommend using like the remote desktop tools without like prior approval for that, but like most of this, these tools don't even leave the network. So like play with our clone, I'd say set up a server and exfil a file or two and just see what it looks like, see what your SIM trigger, if your SIM triggers on anything, or if it doesn't, figure out how to make a trigger on something. Uh, Conti is disbanded, but again, like I've seen all these tools used repeatedly. Uh, I've been at Break Canary for like three years, so I've seen these tools like from, Day one, I think I've seen a lot of these tools like over and over again. So, 
Uh, again, like Stan says, no one will find evil. So like, um, yeah, just kind of learn your network, what's normal. Just like, if you run across an alert that's a false positive, that's also an opportunity to like learn what that normal process looks like and why it triggered your, your rule that sucks or whatever. So look through it and be like, okay, this is normal because of this. So now I understand how, what it looks like when it's normal. Next time I have this alert, uh, I can know what to look for that's different from what I saw last time or whatever. And then as you do it over the years, it gets easier. Um, and then zero days, there's zero zero days in this really. It was this, the, most of the time, most of these exploits are not like zero days. They're most, they're like <laughs> Microsoft patches it and like, what was it? Um, the SMB one was like, um, like several months later after Microsoft patched it, the WannaCry stuff started running around the network. So like, I mean, if it's an unauthenticated remote code execution vulnerability, you should probably patch it as, as quickly as possible, but also don't like get caught up on a zero day that's happening right now. Get caught up on the zero days that are like a month old or several months old and you haven't patched yet a remote code execution. So those are probably more important than the one coming out today because those aren't gonna get exploited today. Those are gonna get exploited months from now. That's it. Q&A? Okay. What, what's your GitHub? Oh, uh, I'm not good at this. Uh, oh, it's over here. Uh, I had the ghost pack thing up, because I had to read about how it works again. Uh, I have a personal one. That was my weird canary one. I think it's KillMJR. I'm on Twitter as KillMJR. I forgot to even mention that. I'm the suspicious link guy. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I believe I'm KillMJR. I just totally spaced that <laughs> to add that. I'll, I'll, I'll post it on my Twitter. That, that'll work. <laughs> that. Oh yeah, I forgot to pull up this. So. Again, this is the Conti the Conti Leaks Twitter account. He just posts this stuff right on Twitter. All the files, they're all right here. He even like talks about some of it a little, little bit. Um, some oh, there's even some fan lines in here. This is what gets me excited. <laughs> uh, files, different stuff. He's just like posting stuff, and I guess the FBI is like, hey, can you not do that, please? Because that's bad. Uh, yeah, that's me. I, I haven't posted in a while because like. It's cool to, I don't know, it's, it's hard to share stuff and that's, yeah, all that stuff. So yeah, I haven't posted in a while. I, I try to post when I can, but it's, it doesn't happen as often. But I'll post my slides to, to the talk there. Yep, Killin JR. It's my last name, first two initials. So, thanks.